Good morning, everyone. We're just waiting for some of the attendees to come in. So we'll just give it another maybe 20, 30 seconds to let everyone enter. Okay, we'll start. Hello and welcome to this webinar discussion on the future of healthcare with a focus on sustainability. My name is Judy Russell and I will be facilitating this morning's webinar. And I'm very, very excited to introduce you to our four speakers, including Helen Maher, who's going to discuss sustainability in the HSE. We have Catherine Duggan from Grant Thornton, who's going to also talk about sustainability. Jen Bradish from, Glan from Grant Thornton will discuss change management and Killian Lavelle will discuss business intelligence. At the end, we'll have a panel discussion and questions and answers. So please do add your questions into the chat. Uh, there should be an option underneath. You might be used to this already where you're able to add them and hopefully we'll get to as many as we can before the end. So our first speaker is Helen Maher. She is HSE's Capital and Estates Manager for Sustainability within the Climate Action and Sustainability Office. Helen joined the HSE in 2005 and started working at national level in 2009 and further in 2013 when HSE Estates created the first National Climate Action and Sustainability Office. Helen's presentation will focus on the HSE Capital and Estates approach to sustainability in healthcare. Welcome, Helen, and I'll pass over to you now. Thanks, Judy. <clears throat> Morning, everyone. Um, so I have my contact details there, and um, I have a lot to cover in, in 10 minutes or such. Um, the, the topic is quite broad, but um, I have my website there, our website for our office. So if there's any details in my slides, which will be shared afterwards, uh, feel free to have a look at our website and um, I, can, I can also share the slides and we can have a look at that later. So thanks, Amber. So I just wanted to start off with an example of the kind of legal and policy obligations that the HSE as a public sector healthcare body would be working towards. Um, so I have to go back one slide. The first one is uh, net zero carbon by, by 2050. So the entire public sector, including the HSE, um, as a large public sector organization, net zero by 2050, which is a huge undertaking. We have to improve our energy efficiency by 50% by 2030, and that's against our 2009 baseline, and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 also against our 2016 baseline. So we have a lot of legal obligations, and SEI published a document there recently that summarised, even just with regard to climate action, um, our legal obligations that we are complied as HSE to, um, to, to meet. Um, which are considerable. We report annually to the SEAI um, in terms of our energy use. We publish our annual statement, which includes a section on em energy. But then also with regard to corporate uh, leadership in the HSE, um, our board managers are now climate action and sustainability champions. They have to undertake leadership training. We have green team established across the health service. We provide training and workshops. And we're working towards our ISO 5001 accreditation, which we have to have in place by 2025. And overall, we have to look at everything we do across the health service and digitize those processes in terms of our services. So next slide, please, Amber. And this is the area I suppose that the capital estates functions is mostly familiar with in terms of our role as an engineering function within the HSE. We're all about buildings, new buildings, and maintaining existing buildings and retrofitting the extensive HSE building stock. So you can see there's a lot of legislation there that we have to comply with around BER ratings. Essentially, we're moving away completely from fossil fuel heating um, towards electric, electric type heating systems, heat pumps, etc. So we have a lot of legislation there around buildings, but also there's other legislation that the HSE as an organization have to comply with, with regard to procurement, particularly of our equipment. Um, we have to comply with the green public procurement guidance that applies to 10 key categories of procurement, which is effectively done by the Office of Government Procurement on behalf of the HSE. Um, so we have to promote smarter travel, we have to phase out parking in favour of uh, public sector um, transport, public transport. So it means that we have to work a lot with key functions across the HSE 
um, you know, the procurement section being critical to that, but also working with other clinical care um, settings in terms of what they're doing and looking at everything that we do in the health service now through the lens of climate action and sustainability. Next slide, please, Amber. So we're obviously in a, in a state of flux as well. The Slauncher Care Programme is underway. We're changing our regional structures. Essentially, we have 49 acute hospitals, nine of which are academic teaching hospitals, um, and they are organised into um, you know, nine regional health areas. We have a large number of uh, community health care buildings, up to you know two and a half thousand. We focus primarily in the Climate Action Sustainability Office on the significant users, the 170 acute hospitals, academic teaching hospitals, and then um, you know the larger community healthcare setting. We focus our resources, we focus our attention towards them, but we also try to provide a service as well to everybody in, in the health service with regard to anyone that approaches our office that wants to improve how they manage their service or uh, their building or you know everything about their team, we try and help them as well uh, across the health service. So we have to do that you know, with uh, the new regional structures in mind as well. Next slide, please, Amber. So just to come back to our office, um, I work in a team and my boss is Peter Smith, who's the Assistant National Director for the Climate Action and Sustainability Office. Kevin Sheridan leads up in our Energy Bureau. Um, so we have a whole range of services that we provide to a hospital across the, the country with 13 energy managers in place. My colleague Vincent then works on the Pathfinder program, which I'll talk to you about with regard to retrofitting the HSE building stock. And I lead out on sustainability, which can mean a lot of different things to different health service staff. But generally, I lead out with a team of five sustainability managers across the country. Um, and we're trying to reach out to all the health service uh, through those um, avenues, I suppose. Next slide, please. So recently we published our infrastructural decarbonisation roadmap. Um, so this would be a requirement for all public sector bodies, large and small, under SEAI guidance. So we published that, it's available on our website. We're primarily looking at scope one and scope two, the fossil fuels, electricity use associated with our buildings, our vehicles, and we also look at scope three, which is the larger area with regard to water, construction, waste, that kind of thing. Um, it's, they're not, they're, they're indirect uh, emissions associated with the operation of a health service. But primarily our um, decarbonisation roadmap is focused at the moment on scope one and scope two, because they're where our legal obligations are with regard to um, greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please, Captain. Amber, thank you. So yeah, these are the areas that we're working with. We're working towards the long-term goal of the public sector health service being net zero by 2050. We work around behavioral change, energy efficiency design towards new buildings, working towards carbon zero design, um, and that's mandatory for all our buildings. Deep energy retrofits of our existing um, building stock. We're looking at transport primarily through the National Ambulance Service now. They're leading out on transport and mobility uh, across the HSE. We look at water and waste management, reducing the amount of water we use. We work very closely with Irish Water on that. Waste management is a key area, obviously, as well. Um, that we're trying to reduce the amount of waste post-COVID, which you know has increased substantially as a result of the uh, COVID pandemic. Sustainable procurement is a huge area, and we're trying to implement through our procurement colleagues the green public procurement guidance that was produced and made mandatory by the EPA. So these are the areas that we're working in, and we're moving into now other areas such as greener models of healthcare. So working with clinical staff asking them to look at what they do with regard to uh, climate action and sustainability, looking at green spaces, very um, sort of topical at the moment, post COVID, a lot of uh, staff and clients requiring outdoor spaces, let's say um, biodiversity kind of projects within our, our campuses and that kind of thing. And obviously looking towards adaptation and, re and resilience in terms of our building stock and healthcare being able to continue no matter what the circumstances are, pandemics, you know, climate change, we have to keep the health service going 24-7, 365. So that's looking at our resilience with regard to our building stock in particular. Next slide, please. 
So that's the areas that we're working in. And this is kind of how we're tackling it. First of all, we have a, a seven point plan, I suppose you could call it. Um, the first is um, our looking at our partnership with SDAI. So I'm going to go into each one of those um, in more detail. So I'll just start with the next slide, please. So essentially everything that we do, we do in partnership with SDAI. We have a partnership arrangement. It allows us to fund forward in three year cycles, 50% um, funding. And we take the um, knowledge that SDAI have when dealing with all public sector bodies, they bring that expertise to us and we apply that to the HSE. You know, we use what would work best in the HSE. We're a member of National Government Task Force with regard to the built environment. We liaise with CODEMA and other kind of organisations at local level with regard to rolling out of district heating, um, you know, um, schemes in Tala and everywhere else in, in Dublin area. Um, we have energy performance officers across all the Section 38, 39 um, HSE funded organisations, as well as our own energy performance officer within the HSE. So that's our big overarching sort of agreement. Um, then we look at our regional energy bureaus that I spoke out. This is our reach. This is how we reach out into the 49 acute hospitals that we have nationwide and the community health care. We reach out through funding and through expertise that we provide to our energy officers. We uh, encourage the hospitals to set up energy teams that meet on a regular basis to access the advice that they need to access funding and to help them with their upgrades of, of all kinds of energy equipment within their hospitals. So the Energy Bureau is a big part of what we do. Next slide, please. So then looking at energy efficient design, so obviously half of what we do is looking at new buildings. I'm here in St. Finbar's Hospital, for example, and we have the construction of a new community nursing unit outside the door there. So healthcare uh, campuses are constantly in a state of regeneration. So energy efficient design at the drawing stage is vital. If, if the buildings we build today need to be carbon zero if we're going to meet our 2050 targets and indeed our 2030 targets. So we provide training to HSE project managers, design teams, and also external architects and members of design teams that we would like to employ. We actually train them as well with regard to energy efficient design to make sure we get the zero carbon buildings that we need now. We have our pilot pathfinder project. So this is where we're looking at our entire building stock with regard to energy retrofit, deep energy retrofit, which means really 25 of percent of the building envelope needs to be retrofitted. So we have to get our buildings as they are now, and they date from this famine era right up to today. So we have to get all those buildings up to at least a B3 in terms of energy rating. So we're looking at 10 of our representative sample buildings across the country, acute hospitals, offices, all the various types of buildings that we have. And we're looking at deep retrofitting those 10 locations this year um, with a view to letting that inform us of how we're going, how much funding we're going to need, but how we're also going to go about retrofitting the, the entire building stock of the HSE, which as I say is two and a half thousand buildings. And then uh, area five is are looking at our meeting program. So information is power and we need to know, we need to link all our meters into our national state information system. We need that kind of data in order to report back to the uh, EPA, the HSE board, um, the SDAI government level, and we also need that in order to be able to move towards our ISO 5001 accreditation by 2025, and we're already uh, well on the road to that. Um, okay, next slide, please. So behavioural change, this is, uh, to me, one of the most important aspects of what we do, because we can provide the same technical support, funding, etc., to a range of HSE hospitals, but how that's rolled out and how successful we are depends on what support we, we provide to our HSE staff. So we need to change minds and hearts and we need to roll out a lot of training with regard to waste reduction, food reduction, and we have that continuously rolling um, to our HSE staff on a, on, you know, a monthly basis. Anyone that is interested across the HSE, also targeted uh, employees, can dial into training to learn more about reducing waste and we link them back to climate action and sustainability. We roll out uh, carbon basics training from the SDI, 
energy basics training that's all available um, on a monthly basis. So nobody is an excuse for not being well up to speed in terms of climate action and sustainability in the HSE. And we're also rolling out a new online sustainability tool. We're using that to reach out to the other, you know, beyond the significant energy users, the other 2,400 managers in charge of HSE buildings. How do we reach them? We're not going to have an energy officer that can call out to every single location. So we've created a sustainability self-help tool for your average HSE manager who's a budget holder for energy, waste and water. And we're giving them the tools in order for them to generate their own action plan, site specific action plan with regard to sustainability. Um, and I think there's a lot of scope for improvement there with regard to the community healthcare setting. So we're ro ro rolling that out at the moment now in CHO4. And we're planning a lot of areas of opportunity for improvement, shall we say. Um, and also then we're, we're supporting the state's function really is supporting all the other functions within the HSE. Um, with regard to procurement and healthcare and clinical aspects of what we do, um, the vehicles, you know, have been rolled out by the National Ambulance Service and beyond to HSE fleet in general. So this for me is very important because it's like climate action and sustainability has gone mainstream across the HSE. It's not just something that the state's function is going to fix and sort out. Um, so it's it's vital. And we have our new climate action and sustainability strategy which the HSE has developed to try and make climate action and sustainability something that every single function service part of the HSE is considering when they do their day-to-day -day job. Um, so like that, we're working with procurement and the National Ambulance Service with regard to fleet and procurement with regard to everything we buy, but particularly with regard to the 10 key categories that are identified by the EPA guidance on green public procurement. Okay. Next slide, please, Amber. So again, this is um, these are the days that I love. It's the day that we raise the green flag in an acute um, teaching hospital. This photograph reminds me of how many people it takes in a healthcare setting to get the green flag accreditation. Um, this is CUH. They were the first hospital to get a green campus flag accreditation. And we're trying to get to the stage now that every single acute hospital in the HSE, the acute academic teaching hospital would have a similar accreditation. Next, next um, slide, please, Amber. So we've a bit of work to do. CUH and SLIGO are the only two hospitals in this list of nine um, that are currently green campus flag accreditation, accreditated. So I would like to see the other, the matter is Beaumont's, you know, all the other large hospitals equally as well accreditation. There is energy, waste and water efficiency projects happening in all of these campuses. But we also need to have the external accreditation to mark for the public and for the staff that climate action and sustainability is very important and should be embedded in everything that we do. Next slide, please. So. That is me. That is sort of a whistle stop tour, I suppose, of what we're doing in the HSE Capital Estates function with regard to climate action and sustainability. Um, please have a look at our website and please get in contact if um, we can help any healthcare locations in the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. And uh, I suppose what struck me was the infrastructure and trying to get two and a half thousand buildings to a B3 energy rating, uh, no easy yeah. feat. And you also yeah. said that sustainability means different things to different people, which is so true. And we have 53 attendees mm. on this webinar today, and I'd love to hear about their individual interpretations of sustainability and what it means to them and how it affects their lives and their jobs. But in saying that, please do add your questions for Helen into the chat and we'll come to them then, George our panel discussion at the end but we'll go to our next speaker next now because I'm sure there's a lot of things that uh, I could even ask Helen but uh, just for the sake of getting through the agenda we have Catherine Duggan. Catherine is a geologist with 15 years global experience who joined Grant Thornton in 2021 to lead the sustainability offering in financial services. Catherine holds a, holds a PhD in geology, a science integral to the understanding of climate change and the associated physical risks. Prior to joining the firm, she worked for 13 years with FTSE listed Tullo Oil, holding both technical and non-technical roles. She is now applying her interest, industry experience to the financial sector, with a particular focus on banking and the risks and opportunities the transition to a low carbon economy presents. So over to you, Catherine. 
Thanks so much, Judy. And, and first, I will apologise. The location I'm in is quite noisy, so I do hope you can hear me. And um, okay, um, I thought Helen's presentation just there was super, and we really touched on some of the the most fundamental issues um, around climate change and emissions. Um, and it's definitely an area of focus um, for for the health centre and 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 for all other sectors, really. What I wanted to talk about um, in this uh, in this short presentation is maybe just the kind of broader uh, sustainability piece. Uh, rightly so, climate change and emissions gets um, gets all the headlines, I suppose. But it's important to recognise that, that sustainability can be broader than that, and 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 is in, in by definition. So, in terms of sustainable development, it was defined um, many years ago by the by the UN, and it's defined as meeting the needs I am of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So, I suppose that essentially means we have to be responsible with the with the tools that we have, and with the resources that we have, and make sure that we don't damage. Um, damage the resources and, and uh, use them all up for, for future generations. So it's, it's quite broad. It, it, again, climate change and emissions is, is the kind of major focus, but it also covers lots of different ways in, in how businesses adapt, and how, they, um, how they operate uh, day to day and how they engage with their communities and their, their staff. So the other phrase, or the other term that that's kind of used interchangeably with sustainability is, um, is, is ESG. And I suppose that would be familiar to, to a lot of people on the call too. So ESG, environmental, social, and governance factors. And these are really elements of sustainability. They're more familiar in terms of kind of the corporate space and people might use it more than they do in terms of sustainability. And really what they are, are factors that might have a positive or negative impact on the financial performance of, um, of a business or um, a healthcare, healthcare provider. It covers different elements. Um, the environment is really how you engage with the environment. So how are you using resources? It relates to emissions, it relates to waste, it relates to water. So Helen's given us a really good um, insight into how the HSE are approaching that kind of environmental pillar. But it also incorporates social and, and governance factors too. And I think they are also incredibly important and relevant to the healthcare um, sector. So social is really about looking at the organization's relationship with its own stakeholders. But stakeholders is a, you know, it's a really broad term. It can involve its staff, the patients, its supply chain, the community that it works in. You know, it's it's even its finances and the 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 banks that in, that it engages in. So it's a really broad um, kind of category, and there's lots of different elements around that. And then the other one is governance, and that's really about how well is it is an organisation run? How is it led? Is it transparent? And um, does it have appropriate policies and procedures in place? Now, governance is something that has been looked at, I suppose, in isolation for a long time, um, and probably not within the the kind of sustainability or ESG um, umbrella. But it does form an important part um, of the ESG lens. So we move on to the next slide, please. So here I've just given some examples of some of the factors that that might fall into these different categories: so environmental, social, and governance. And I think what's really important to recognise is there isn't actually a defined, comprehensive, final list of all the factors that that fall under ESG. And that's really because the sustainability is so broad. Under each one of these um, line items here, that. Um, that's highlighted, you could break it down further and further. Um, so it's just to kind of give a flavour and a sense of what they cover. So the environment, conservation of the natural world. We mentioned uh, water pollution, Helen also mentioned biodiversity, really key. Um, waste management, water scarcity, water efficiency, that would all fall under the environmental leg. And just social, which probably is the one that's slightly more intangible and sometimes difficult for people to get their heads right. So that can be around data protection and privacy, obviously a really um, key area of focus for the, for the health sector. Gender and diversity um, and ensuring, uh, I suppose, an enabling environment to make sure there is no discrimination or, or no kind of bias institutionally. Employee engagement, how do you deal with your, your staff? How do you engage with them? That might be to do with collective bargaining, that might be to do with um, engaging with their concerns, having a forum where there can be a discussion between management and, and staff. Community relations, obviously really important um, in terms of healthcare, human rights, labour standards, and um, so generally working kind of environments, those type of things. And then governance, so this can be around, um, again, those kind of essential best practice policies so around bribery and corruption, uh, around lobbying, uh, whistleblower schemes, they're particularly important, um, and order security structures, so just all those kind of uh, frameworks and policies to ensure that um, that the businesses will run responsibly and uh, efficiently. And um, so moving on to the next slide there, please. So th the, the factors that we mentioned just there and the examples were quite broad, but here we try to collate some really specific kind of healthcare examples 
I won't go into the energy and water um, and waste because Helen has, has done a really great job in really defining and going through some practical, tangible examples um, around how they affect the healthcare infrastructure. Um, and I think even some of the, the stuff that she mentioned in terms of the age of some of the buildings, you know, famine, uh, famine age buildings, like that really demonstrates the scale of the um, of the operation and the, and the great work that, that um, she is leading out in, in terms of addressing those factors. I think data security, um, again, is something particularly in relation to um, to healthcare records. We saw the recent um, data breach. It doesn't have to be that kind of sophisticated. It can just be access to um, you know files that are left unattended. Obviously, there's, there's a critical issue around the, I suppose, healthcare records more than anything else are potentially the most sensitive type of of information and the importance of ensuring that there is um, accurate and robust uh, policies and procedures around kind of data security and how those really sensitive records are, are handled. Employee health and safety, again, this would kind of fall into the social pillar, um, but obviously you think of, of some of the stories, particularly around any casualty and um, the, the impacts ensuring that you know, there's appropriate security, there's appropriate safe working environments for your staff. And um, that is, you know, and that kind of respect um, and, and ensuring that they are treated, uh, they're treated fairly. That is, um, that is an element that falls under sustainability um, as well. So it's ensuring you have a, an appropriate work environment and a safe work environment for, for your staff. Then finally, we talk about uh, employee engagement, diversity and inclusion. I'm sure many of you, like, um, like ourselves, have diversity and inclusion committees. You have programs to ensure um, that, you know, that the, I suppose that the working environment is reflective um, and the management are reflective of the staff that are employed. Um, and again, that's an area that we're seeing more and more focus on, particularly in relation to uh, recruitment. Um, it's something that, uh, that I think more and more um, potential, uh, potential staff are looking to see, you know, what are, what are the policies around that um, and how effectively they are, they are put in place. And I suppose do even that recognition that it's an issue that needs to be um, addressed and, uh, and considered as part of kind of business best practice. Yeah, so if we move on to the, the next slide there, um, I suppose one of the one of the questions sometimes we, we get asked, not just in, in healthcare, but in, in lots of other sectors, is why now? Why is sustainability suddenly becoming such a big um, such a big focus? I think the climate change piece is easy to understand. We can all appreciate the, the tangible impacts that climate change is already starting to have on our environments. Um, but the wider kind of sustainability discussion, sometimes it becomes um, uh, a little bit unclear as to, as to what, what's driving the urgency around it. So I just want to put this slide in, maybe just talk about a little uh, around policy um, and some of the regulations that we're seeing coming down the track. So most of you will probably have heard of the Paris Climate Agreement, 2015, but also the Sustainable Development Goals. So both of these international agreements were signed off in 2015, at the beginning of 2016, um, and really what they are are a blueprint for how the world needs to develop and the changes it needs to make by 2030 in order to ensure a sustainable, fair and equitable environment for, for all people. Um, what's particularly important about that is that the EU then looked at those, um, those two policies and agreements and made a strategic decision that from here on in, any uh, policies, regulations, legislation that they um, that they created should look first to the Paris Climate Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals and ensure that they are facilitating um, those changes and supporting them. Uh, as a result of that, a number of initiatives have um, and policies have been announced. Probably the key one is the European Green Deal, so published in 2019. Um, it focuses on, again, emissions, that kind of climate change piece is, is really big, but there's also wider um, wider implications. The financial sector has received an awful lot of regulation and focus. Essentially, if you want to change things, follow the money. Um, but there's also a, a really critical piece of uh, a, a directive called the um, called CSRD, um, which is the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. And this directive uh, is broader than just the financial services um, sector. And really what it's trying to do is bring sustainability reporting, which many companies um, and firms have done for a long time, under voluntary guise, there has been no or very limited mandatory reporting um, around sustainability. And what CSRD is aiming to do is to bring sustainability reporting in line with financial reporting. So what does that mean? It means there are going to be defined standards of what companies um, and institutions will have to publish in relation to sustainability information. Um, it means that they will be audited. So for the first time, this information will be held to the same standard as financial information. Um, and it will mean that there will be a, a, 
what we've had in the past is that people who did uh, report on sustainability did through did so through a variety of different um, voluntary frameworks, guidelines, um, and it made it very difficult to compare one with another. Uh, what the European Union are now doing are developing their own set of mandatory standards. So the same level of disclosure will apply across the board. Um, and that's in the process uh, of being developed as, as we speak. And we actually have a number of members of our team that are helping to draft those standards uh, right now. So who falls into scope of this? At a very high level, um, you have to meet two or three tests, but the, the scoping issue is something that, that does need to be looked at on an individual basis. So two or three tests include if you have total assets greater than 20 million, if you've net turnover greater than 40 million, or an average number of employees uh, during the fiscal year of 250 million. If you meet two of those uh, three tests, um, it's, it's likely that you will fall under CSOD, but as I said, there, there are nuances um, around that as well. So if we move on to the next slide, maybe just give you a sense of the type of information um, that people will have to uh, report on. Uh, there are a number of uh, mandatory, mandatory declarations and some that are subject to materiality. And materiality essentially means, is a particular topic relevant or important to your business? And if it is, then you should report um, under it. But the type of ones that will be mandatory for everybody that falls in scope, firstly, is around climate change. So a lot of the data and the information that Helen was speaking about, but also social. So this one here, ES, ES or S1, um, own workforce. So that's about your own workforce. It's about working standards. It's about um, work conditions, work-life balance, those type of things. So all of these standards um, are in draft form at the moment. They are being reviewed and um, feedback being collated. Um, so, so you can see right now what, what the requirements are, but they're subject, subject to change. Um, but essentially, it's important to recognise that, you know, if you do fall into scope, it's important to start considering these issues. It's important to start collecting the data that would be relevant um, and will enable you to report. Um, and essentially, just to bear in mind that, that your sustainability performance will now become part of the public records. Um, and one of the things to, to note as well is that even if you don't fall into scope, what may happen is that up the supply chain, so some of your suppliers and um, some of your uh, your banks, they may be obliged to report. And if they are obliged to report, they may need to seek information from you because they will be obliged to report about their value chain um, as well. So even if you don't fall into scope, it's likely somebody, one of your stakeholders, is going to start asking you for this um, for this information. So when does this all come into force? Um, the first uh, set of reporting are due for 2025. So this is for a, a smaller subset of large organizations. Um, and then the, the more broader, it's maybe about 50,000 um, companies and institutions. They'll have to start reporting um, from 2000, for financial year 2025. So that'll be the first disclosures in 2026. Um, so it's a, it's a much larger piece than, than just the healthcare sector, but it will affect um, certain bodies within the healthcare sector too. So I think it's, it's just important to kind of flag that as well. Can we move on to the, the next slide then? Yeah, so again, these are some, uh, I won't go into the, the, so much detail on this, but it just gives you an idea of the, the type of um, the type of data that will need to be uh, reported. So things like staff treatment and uh, retention, so that's about your, your workforce um, engagement um, and uh, Pay so adequate wage is one of the one of the key areas. Workplace instance so again health and safety, um, last time instance that type of information, um, and also uh, the ways in which you are looking. I suppose just just understanding how your organisation is impacted by sustainability matters. So what are the most material sustainability matters to you, um, and what you're doing about that. So Helen has has highlighted the, the focus on emissions. It's likely that for most healthcare organizations, emissions and, and waste and water use are going to be some of those critical areas that need to be reported on. So that just kind of gives you a, a flavor of, of kind of the granularity as well. Sometimes I think it's useful to, 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 to really understand how detailed some of these disclosures may be. Again, subject to uh, subject to change and, and in draft form, but it gives you a sense of the direction of travel. We move on to the last slide then. Yeah, so I think just from a, from just, just stepping back and, and understanding what it really takes to embed sustainability um, in a business. And I think and, and journey is a word that, that's overused uh, in terms of sustainability, but it is true. Um, there is a whole uh, there's a whole progression that needs to take place when an organization is looking at sustainability and considering how its impact, how it factors into to business as usual. 
um, there will be both regulatory and stakeholder expectations. So, so whether it's um, that you fall under CSRD, whether it's some of the energy um, directives and, and some of the cap requirements, um, or whether it's, it's um, stakeholder expectations from your staff, from your patients, um, from, your, uh, from your bank, from those providing uh, finance, from your investors. Um, for lots of different reasons, people are going to be looking to you to be able to articulate how sustainability um, impacts your business and, and how you are integrating it into, um, into your plans going forward. It's really about ensuring resilience um, across those lo lots of different lines. Um, so a few things maybe to just, just bear in mind and, and some of the challenges that we've seen from clients. Firstly, it, it really requires a, a change in mind shift. So there's, there's a whole piece around upskilling and training, making sure people are aware um, of, of what's involved in sustainability and what it actually is. Sustainability, I think, probably has a problem in terms of communication. There's a lot of buzzwords, there's a lot of jargon, and oftentimes it's not accessible um, and it's not clear what we're speaking about. So the, there is a whole piece there making sure everybody is familiar with, with the vocabulary, but also simplify, simplifying what the issues um, are. I think in terms of resourcing, making sure that people have um, adequate resources to, to look at it, to be able to collect the data, to be able to consider um, how it's in, embedded in, in business plans and how it should be. That's one of the real challenges that we've seen. And I think one of the other things that's really incredibly important, and you can see Helen has, has obviously already um, landed on that and has huge amounts of support internally, is that kind of tone from the top. So it's very difficult for somebody at a, at a mid-level to try and influence um, the behavior of an organization as a whole, particularly when it comes to strategic planning in terms of you know three, five, 10 year plans. Um, so it's really important that you get buy-in from, from senior levels that they understand um, why this is important and understand uh, what it takes in order to, to get it done. Um, so I will leave it there. I think that the next the next part that we're going to move on to is change management, which is really um, really important part of this. And again, apologies if, the, if it was noisy. Uh, sincerely, um, hope you could hear some, some of what I said anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. And the noise wasn't that bad at all, so don't worry about it. Um, Catherine, there is just one specific question that I might just ask you before we get to the panel discussion because it's, it's specific. Um, can you clarify that the Grant Thornton team are helping to draft the CSRD standards? Yes, that's right. So we have taken a strategic um, decision to invest in in, um, in CSRD. So we're working with EFRAG. Um, so they uh, they basically put a call out for, for support. So it's, it's pro bono support. Um, but we have a team of five, six people in there now that are helping to draft the standards, specifically the sector specific standards. Um, but we've taken that as a, as a decision to because we think it's important. We think it's important from a, from a kind of community perspective in terms that we kind of help out, but also in terms of how we can support our clients, you know, to really understand what's gone into it and what the expectations are from the regulation. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. No so problem. both, sorry, both Helen and Catherine called out the importance of behavioural change and shifting mindsets towards change. And our next speaker, Jen Bradish, is going to explore exactly this further. So Jen is an associate director on the business consulting team in Grant Thornton. She currently leads the change management service line and has extensive consulting experience leading large scale engagements. Jen joined Grant Thornton in 2016. However, she has over 12 years experience across a number of sectors, including human resources, healthcare, education, utility and property. So over to you, Jen. Thanks, Judy. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us here this morning. Um, I'll jump straight in. Um, so oh, you might just go back a slide there for a second. Um, so when we talk about sustainability, I suppose we typically talk about kind of longer term goals. So rather than talking to you about specific tools or activities, um, I'm going to talk to you about how you can prepare and support your teams in the longer term. Um, by shifting mindsets towards change and building that change capability to better enable you to face changes. Um, so it does seem quite timely that I've kind of chosen this topic um, as one of the HSE's action areas. And on top of that, I suppose as well, the HSC have recently released a booklet on creating conditions for change and integration. Um, it's part of their overall change guide. So if you are looking for any further reading material on any of the topics that I'm covering today, uh, look no further. And I suppose Helen also mentioned a number of different projects that are underway in the HSE, such as the Net Zero 2050, Slaunch Care, the Decarbonisation Roadmap, all of which are kind of mammoth undertakings. And they can seem kind of overwhelming or unattainable initially, just given their scale and complexity. And um, so what I'm hoping to do is that I suppose by the end of my presentation, you can all have kind of a better understanding of the things that you can do to, to start kind of shifting that mindset. Um, and embedding a culture of change into your teams so that those kind of projects and targets seem more manageable and achievable. Okay, next slide there. 
change is hard. So think to yourself just for a minute now, how many times you have heard that phrase mentioned? Um, and I think it's safe to say that most of us have heard it at least once. Um, and my problem with this kind of mindset towards change is that it equates hard with failure. Um, and by doing so, kind of it impairs our sustainability initiatives. So as humans, we have this natural bias towards failure. So we assume that failure is a more likely outcome than success. And as a result of that, then we often treat successful outcomes as flukes and bad results as proof that change is difficult. So the good news is that we can address this problem by changing the way in which we think and talk about change and sustainability initiatives. So just if you move on to the next slide then. So change is hard in the same way that it's hard to finish a marathon. So it requires significant effort. But the fact that it requires effort doesn't negate the fact that most people who put in the effort and commit to the change will eventually succeed. Um, and that's how we should be thinking about sustainability and our healthcare system. So if you think about it, we've been learning new skills and adapting to new initiatives since they we were born. We adapt to new scenarios and situations every day. Like how many of us have heat cups? How many of us use reusable shopping bags or have switched to maybe a hybrid car or fully electronic car? All of those initiatives, they all took a bit of effort. But they weren't hard to do. And um, so that's the first step that we can take in shifting our mindsets towards the incoming changes around sustainability. So it's to flip our thinking to one that says, Change isn't hard, it just requires effort. Next slide then. So before I suppose we start looking at kind of practical tips on how to shift your mindset, I just want to kind of bring it back to basics in order to kind of provide you with an understanding of what change management actually is and why it's worth shifting that mindset to look at initiatives through a change lens. Um, we do need to kind of understand change if we're going to build that capability within our teams and if we're going to shift that mindset towards sustainability projects requiring effort. So change management. Change management is all about the people side of a project. So it's about enabling people, engaging people and inspiring people to adopt different mindsets, behaviours and capabilities. Um, and it focuses more so on kind of levels of adoption rather than kind of the delivery of tasks. Next slide. So I suppose why does managing change and building your change capability and mindset matter. Um, so change can cause confusion and disruption if it's not managed carefully. Um, and considering the vast amount of changes that our healthcare system has undergone in the last three years um, and the tasks that lie ahead in order to achieve our sustainability targets, it's important that I suppose, no matter how big or small the initiative, that we look at it through that, through that change lens. Um, and what that will do is that it will ensure that mindsets are aligned so that we're all working towards the same goal, that everyone knows the reason why the change is needed, um, that we're using that consistent, clear messaging, reinforcing key messages and avoiding any confusion about anything, um, that we're supporting staff through the change, being aware that they may have worries that mightn't have crossed your radar yet, but that they're important to them. Um, that we're putting ourselves in the other person's shoes, thinking about what's in it for them, what will motivate them to make the change. Um, and so that we're inspiring people rather than forcing them to change. Next slide then. So I suppose now that we've kind of covered the basics very quickly, um, I wanted to go through some practical things that you can start doing in order to build up that change capability and mindset within your team. So it's important to note that this won't happen overnight, it will take time, but the more that you do these things and the more that you share the knowledge about how to do these things and help and support others, the more that others will follow and gradually you'll build up that mind, that new mindset and change capability. So firstly then, you don't wait until information, or don't wait until full information is available. So especially I suppose in the early stages of any initiative, there's generally a lot of uncertainty, a lack of solutions, which can lead teams to hold back communicating until there's further information to kind of give. Um, and the issue here is that silence gets filled with gossip and rumors, which can spread and gain traction. So it's better to say, we don't know yet, but this is what we're going to find out. Next then is to focus on communicating the rationale and the benefits of the project. So you can never over communicate the benefits. Um, in stressful environments, people tend to only retain about 20% of the information you're telling them. So typically the first and last sentence of what they've been told. Um, and before they're going to start actually listening to you, 
um, and what you're actually asking them to try and do, they'll want to know that you care about their current situation. So if you put yourself in their shoes, what are their concerns? What are their interests? What's in it for them in order to motivate them to do what you're asking? Next then is around communication. So sending the right information at the right time from the right person. I know Catherine touched on this as well. So your teams need to understand how any of those changes are going to relate to them at an individual level. So segment information, target specific audiences and avoid information overload. Um, you could consider using the likes of a team lead to deliver some of your messaging. Um, because often I suppose people will prefer to hear information from a trusted source who can kind of relate to their concerns. Next up then is about inviting stakeholders to own elements of the initiative. So this can be a really, really powerful way to engage stakeholders and to gain buy-in and help them understand the way, or to help them understand the change and why it's actually occurring. Um, it can also show that you trust them, their skills and their judgment to actually complete a task, which kind of empowers them. It creates greater commitment to the change while building on their capabilities. Next then, I suppose, is around feedback. So it's to value stakeholder feedback and to act on it, even if you don't think it's good feedback. So we always want to encourage feedback and have a timely response. And that piece is critical. So if you think about it, if you've ever asked a question and got no response, what happens? You quickly just disengage. You, have, you kind of feel that you haven't been listened to after you've kind of tried to provide feedback. And realistically, you're not going to put any ideas or suggestions or questions forward again you're less inclined to offer any input. Um, so I suppose the key thing here is just to make sure that you respond positively, thank people for the feedback, and also just to respond in a timely matter, or manner, sorry. Last then, but in no ways least, is to publicly recognize and thank your stakeholders. Um, so be that at a town hall, via an email, a webinar, or a team's meeting, um, public recognition goes a long, long way. So not only does it actually boost the person and group's confidence, but it can also encourage others to get involved and want to contribute. That I think draws my close. And so I hope there were some helpful tips and tricks that you've picked up. Um, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them into the Q and A. Great. Thank you, Jen. And I really loved all of the actionable tips that you've given us. I think they're applicable to so many different scenarios. And I actually feel, felt like printing out one of your slides and uh, potentially putting it up on my wall. So I remember to take them through the day and the week and the month with me. Um, yeah, feel free. Are... Sorry, go ahead, Jen. No, I was just going to say, feel free to print it out. Or do anything. Thank you. <laughs> So we are we we're kind of a little bit over time. Not to put you under too much pressure, Killian. But uh, just before I introduce Killian, please do add your questions and answers or your questions to the chat. And even if you just have comments, you can also add them to the Q and A section as well. You all should see a Q and A option on the bottom ribbon of your Zoom screen, and within there, then you'll be able to ask a question or leave a comment. It's it's not just for um questions. So next up, we have Killian Lavelle. Killian is a manager within Grant Thornton's business consulting unit. He joined Grant Thornton's team in June 2021 and has acquired extensive experience over a number of years working in both clinical and management roles in the Irish healthcare sector. Killian has a diverse background in health, including roles in operational management and effectiveness, IT and information governance, program management, stakeholder management, process redesign and improvement and risk management. So I'll pass over to you now, Killian, to talk about the future of healthcare data. Thanks, Judy. Um, so as just mentioned, I'm going to run through um, the importance of data in healthcare and I suppose how business intelligence um, tools can support with the delivery of um, sustainability initiatives. So looking at data in healthcare, um, and in 2022, Ireland ranked fifth out of the 27 EU states in the Digital Economy and Society Index. So that's a composite index. And it's developed to measure, I suppose, the progress of EU member states in their digital transformation journeys. And I suppose along with this digital transformation journey, there's a growth in data globally and specifically within the healthcare sector. It accounts for 30 percent of the world's data volume, and that's expected to increase to 36 percent by 2025, which is a significant growth. And it begs the question, our healthcare system is already drowning in data. So we're all aware of, you know, there's a huge amount of data collection points within the industry from 
electronic health records, wearable devices, Internet of Things devices, and, and a vast array of clinical information, which all feeds this concept of, of big data. And we can use this vast array of data to produce multiple outputs, whether that be dashboards, you know, feeding machine learning models or artificial intelligence solutions. So how do we ensure that organizations have access to the right data to support improvements in healthcare quality and also in sustainability? So a lot of research suggests that the industry hasn't fully yet developed the level of data management and analysis necessary to make use of the data that's available. And I suppose as a result, executives can be face the risk of um, being overwhelmed by a flood of unusable information. So figuring out how we develop systems and use this growing quantity of and variety of digital information is one of the most important and formidable missions um, of, of the healthcare time at the moment. So healthcare is a complex system. There's multiple interdependencies at play and a vast array of factors that influence outcomes. There's not one single source of data that we can use to understand how complex systems behave. So we need several data points uh, or sources to understand how complex healthcare systems perform. And within the industry, there's multiple levels of data. So from population level down to patient level. So population, population level can be your mortality rate, CSO statistics, organization level, staff experiences, Service level, we can look at, you know, wait times, bed availabilities within hospitals, bed utilization within hospitals, and then down to the granular patient level of blood sugars and temperature and that associated um, factors. And I suppose with this um, continued digitalization in the industry, it's important that organizations understand their data quality, their data accessibility, integrity, and security. As mentioned by Catherine, cyber attacks have increased dramatically um, over recent years and in fact hit an all time high last year globally. So data security has to become a strategic agenda item for executives as it's critical hospitals and health systems can identify um, and quickly respond to any intrusions that may occur. So next slide. So to look at how we might visualize information uh, it's important that we make best use of the available tools for analytics and visualization that are out there. And you can see in the next two slides, we've used Microsoft Power BI to demonstrate how we can provide interactive insights into healthcare data. It's really important that organizations provide their team members and workforce with a window into their data that's segmented at the right level for the right users. By providing this information in the right format that's most helpful for their users, it will allow them, I suppose, to review, interrogate, control the information, and ultimately have ownership of the data for their respective areas. You can see on the right here, there's some, I suppose, demand um, interactive components that would allow managers to assess for resource management and plan for demand and capacity and some, and some um, clinical outcomes as well. So, Fundamentally, having the right data provided in the right format to the workforce will support critical patient decisions, clinical decisions, and also business decisions. Next slide there. So looking at data for sustainability, um, Helen mentioned that data is power. And I think having the right systems and processes in place to gather the information related to sustainability is key. Also, as outlined by Catherine there, there's multiple initiatives coming down the line and requirements for healthcare and all organizations to track and monitor their sustainability and the impacts um, that they have. Um, so data plays a crucial role in this and within the healthcare industry, there's a number of different domains there that we can look at. So looking at the patient outcomes, we can analyze patient data and ask questions of the information. You know, are we getting the outcomes we want? And if not, what is the data telling us that we may need to change? Looking at prevention, health inequalities, and social determinants, the UK government has described this decade as a decade of proactive, predictive, and personalized prevention in healthcare. And using new technology such as AI, genomic sequencing, machine learning will really help create this new prevention model. Again, we can use data to inform research up resource optimization, analyzing data on, on resources such as energy, water, materials, people 
We're able to identify areas of waste inefficiency and develop sustainable practices while simultaneously reducing cost. Um, waste reduction, by tracking data on where waste generation and disposal happens in organizations, healthcare organizations, we can identify where the waste um, happens and develop strategies to minimize the environmental impact of operations. Sustainable procurement, by tracking information on suppliers, healthcare organizations can really identify and prioritize the procurement of sustainable products uh, moving forward. Patient engagement, again, we can use data to promote sustainability to the patients um, within the IR system. We can encourage them to adopt healthy lifestyle behaviors and reduce their impact on the environment, such as, I suppose, taking um, active transportation and, and reducing waste. And Helen also mentioned green infrastructure. By tracking green infrastructure initiatives, you know, such as green roofs and walls, we can really see how healthcare systems and specific areas can promote sustainable practice and improve air quality, water quality, and also support biodiversity. And then finally, so the European Health Data Space was launched last year. It's a health specific ecosystem and it's comprised of rules, common standards and practices, in, in, infrastructures and governance frameworks. And really what it's aimed at is empowering individuals through increased digital access to have control of their personal electronic health data at a national level and also at an EU level. It's aimed at fostering a single market for electronic record systems, medical devices, and AI systems. And it's aiming to provide a trustworthy and efficient setup for the use of health information for research, innovation, policy making, and also regulatory activities. And you can see there are some of the huge financial savings associated with you know, interacting with this space and really growing digital health within the European sector. That's it for me. I'm happy to have any questions. Thanks Thank very so much. much. Thanks a million, Killian. Really appreciate it. Now, we have three minutes left. So what I might do is I might keep us on for an extra five minutes, maybe a little bit more than that. So for the attendees who can stay on, please do. Um, first off, I'm just going to ask this one to Helen. It's an anonymous question. And it seems as though Helen is doing great work, but it's not in the public domain or high enough on the agenda. What else can be done to promote and accelerate this work? Um, yeah, well, I suppose um, our target audience is HSE staff. So first and foremost, so our, our main, you know, you know, target interest is the 110,000 people that work for the HSE. Um, and yeah, we have our websites, um, which are available on the hse.ie forward slash sustainability. Um, it is difficult to get good news uh, into the media nowadays. So we have our own um, magazines, again, we're targeting our staff. And that's why I think accreditation is so important because every person that walks into CUH or Sligo Hospital, the first thing they see is the green campus flag flying outside the door. The whole hospital is branded, you know, in terms of its accreditation. Um, so I suppose we, we spend a lot of our time communicating with Department of Health, with government, with SDI, EPA, um, and, and they're the people that we communicate a lot with. We'd love to get more, you know, information about about what the HSC is doing out in the general domain. So, um, you know, but I suppose we can't give up the day job just to communicate to the general public. It's difficult to do it with media at the moment. It tends to be very negative stories. Um, you know, even when you do a positive project, there's sometimes to be a negative spin put on it. Um, but, you know, we're using all the reporting channels that we have available to us to reach out to the public. And primarily, we're reaching out to our staff and they reach into every family, every community, every village, every town in the country. And that's how we're trying to reach the general public. Excellent. And would anyone else like to, kind of, I suppose, Jen, from a change management perspective? Yeah. Um, and look, I think, Helen, you're doing all, everything right there, I think. Really, it's just about having that structure around communication and even celebrating those small wins internally, like you said, um, and then using your staff to kind of share that messaging internally because your target audience is your staff initially um, and kind of building on that momentum. So if there is kind of progress or a small win to build on that momentum and make sure that I suppose any of those good news stories, it is clear on, I suppose, who was involved, thanking people that were involved and kind of trying to get more and more people engaged. 
And Catherine, would you say that like, you know, the, the I suppose, emphasis or the, the necessity at the moment is with companies and healthcare is, is kind of more on the reporting side of things at the moment rather than the external comms? Do you think that's the priority? I'm actually just in the middle of a fire alarm. Um, so I might, I might maybe pass that on. To Please do. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Stay safe. And um, Gillian, do you have anything to kind of give on this perspective um, from a data point of view or business intelligence? Uh, yeah, I think it's just that it's important that the progress that's made is measured. So as Jen said, that it can be, you know, portrayed to the staff to show that the work that's going into the initiatives or the benefits of it are being realized. And that, you know, as uh, the reporting requirements progress and, you know, as companies are required to report on the sustainability initiatives that, you know, the systems and processes are in place now so that when they do come on stream that they're ready to hit the ground running. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, we're living in a, in a time where there's a lot of, I suppose, technological advancements. And I imagine the future generations will be like, oh, it's you just pull up the data, you know, it's just there. And it's like, well, you haven't been through the process of getting us to, you know, making that so accessible and easy to follow. So it's it's a different kind of uh, time that we're living in at the moment, a transitional time. Um, another one for Helen, with an organisation as broad and as diverse as the HSE, what are the key challenges that you're finding in terms of getting people to change their behaviors um well i suppose um first of all yeah that's one of the great things we have are, are a lot of staff that are engaged so um i suppose i would tell my team that if they are working you know with 15 hospitals and if they're making good traction you know with 10 out of 15 that's okay because they have to keep working with the people that are engaging with us so i suppose it's to focus our attention on the hospitals and the staff that are ready to make changes and sustainable changes. But I find a lot of healthcare staff are in totally engaged in climate action and sustainability issues. Sometimes there's a bit of a disconnect between you know, what we do at home and what we do at work. Uh, a disconnect, for example, I was in a hospital last week that had the heating on 24 seven, 365. So none of us would ever do that at home in a million years, but yet we can come to work and that can seem like it's okay. Um, so that's kind of what we're we're up against all the time. Also, I suppose the HSE is quite a, you know, it's a busy place. It's a very regulated place. Um, you know, we have to be aware of the con conditions that people are working under, you know, the environment that they work in, their priorities with regard to their day-to-day -day jobs, which is life-saving stuff. Um, so we need to work around that and make sure that we're engaging with them at the level that they can engage. But yeah, no, I mean, I don't see it as um, a barrier. I see that when I see lots of opportunity, we work with the people that are on the same page as us and we sort of keep chipping away, keep talking, keep communicating, keep showing uh, hospitals maybe and CEOs who, of hospitals that aren't engaged yet what their other hospitals in their group are doing. So I make them feel like they're being left behind. And that's how we work, you know, that they're, they're, they're behind the curve in terms of climate action, sustainability. And I get them to reassign someone as part of their team that we can liaise with on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and, and then they have access to funding, the technical supports and all the stuff that we have to offer them. So really that's kind of how we go about it. Fascinating. I think that that's how tidy towns also, they have a leaderboard and uh, nobody wants to be at the bottom. So everyone tries to get to the top yeah. and that's the incentive, yeah. I suppose, that people need to get there. And uh, just just quickly back to you then, Jen, um, I suppose Helen also discussed um, COVID and how, you know, there was probably potentially more waste during that time. Are you seeing the return to the normal change management kind of structure of doing things post COVID now? Or is there still kind of a lingering kind of effect of slow change or, or things like that? I think COVID probably showed us that, I suppose what I was going back to, that change just requires a bit of effort. Like there was that big shift from you're suddenly now working from home um, and people just did it. It wasn't, no one really complained. Well, they might have complained. Some people probably did. Um, but there was just that shift and things happened and you just adapted. Um, and I think a lot of, I think changes actually accelerated through that period of time, especially with the HSE. Like a lot of things just happened and a lot of things got agreed. Um, and I even remember someone said to me, they're like, never waste to go crisis and to like get things done and get things moving. Um, so I actually think, I don't think 
it's slowed as such. Um, but I think there was that urgency with COVID that just meant that things had to progress a lot faster than they do at the moment. Um, and I think one thing to note as well, I suppose, just on any of kind of the, the people that might not be as well engaged as the other groups would be, I suppose, the, the really important factor from a change aspect and a change mindset is for, I suppose, to listen to them as to why they're not changing. Is it an information gap? Do they not know enough about it? Or do they not know, is it a knowledge gap? Do they not know how to do it or what the first step is to do it? Um, so it's just trying to try and understand the why as to why they're not engaging um, and then building on that. Um, a lot of it is just kind of listening. They might even just want to have a rant and then you can get to the, the why at the end of that. Excellent. And uh, I just have one final question there for um, Helen as well, and we'll just leave it on that. Mm -hmm. um, could Helen please give some information on what is happening in the clinical space in relation to environmental impact? Yeah, so as I kind of mentioned in our presentation, um, the HSE has developed a new climate action and sustainability strategy. So that's been led out by a clinical lead, Dr. Philip Crowley in the HSE. Um, so I'm delighted to say, as I say, I've seen a change in the HSC recently in terms of climate action and sustainability going mainstream across everything we do. So we would work uh, closely with a lot of organisations like uh, Irish Doctors for the Environment, um, Nurses for Climate Change, that kind of thing, organisations that have engaged with different types of medical profession, professions within the HSE. So we have a whole strategy now that we have recently published with regard to greening clinical care. And it's a whole model of looking at what we do on a day to day basis in terms of clinical care through sustainability. And that's something that wouldn't have happened a couple of years ago. You know, I would have gone to NHS events a few years ago and there would have been a lot more clinical people in the room, whereas if I organised a sustainability event here in the health service would have been all facilities engineering type people that I would have been speaking to. Whereas now we're really engaging with our clinical staff and everybody that works in the hospital at all levels, clinical, non-clinical, they're all invited to be members of a green team, members of an energy team. And so we're engaging with all staff on that basis and they have great input to give to us and they look at what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis through the lens of climate action and sustainability and make small changes that have a big impact. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. And I'm so sorry that we're after going a little bit over time. If you have any further questions, you can get in touch directly with today's speakers. And what we're going to do is we'll leave their email addresses on the screen for a couple of minutes so you, that you can take them down. A recording of the webinar will also be made available and we'll follow up with the link within a week. Thank you so much for taking the time to attend this morning's webinar. And we hope you've gained more knowledge and understanding on the future of healthcare with a focus on sustainability. Goodbye, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.